Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ask Sarah Anything. We are so glad that you joined us today on this Thursday night. Thank you for giving us this next hour. And we're, I'm excited to be here with Sarah to ask her questions, get to know her a bit better, ask her questions from her career. And uh, this is sponsored by Navigators Hollywood. And so I, I hope tonight you'll see what an amazing actress that Sarah is. If you've seen any of her work, you know that. Um, and by amazing, I mean, like you watch her and you think that was amazing. So <laughs> we'll ask her a little bit about her process, about her career. Some of you probably know her from Grey's Anatomy. She's also been featured in a number of significant roles. And yeah, I think tonight you'll learn something from her life and be inspired. So this is a time where you get to ask Sarah questions on your screen should be at the bottom of your screen should be something that says Q&A. If you just click on that, you can type in questions and those will get to us and then we'll be, uh, Sarah will be answering those questions. I'm gonna start us off by asking a question from this book called, oh. You're Pulling My Leg. This is a book that I actually wrote and it has a lot of questions in it. Uh, it's a kind of a get to know you game. I'm gonna be giving away three of these at the very end of this <laughs> time together based on uh, trivia, Sarah Drew trivia. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask the questions at the very end and we'll see who's the first to answer them and you will win a copy of this game book. But meanwhile, the first question will come from this. So Sarah, Give me a number between one and 225, and I'll ask you the first question. 196. 196, okay, going for the big numbers, big numbers. Okay, here we go. Okay, <clears throat> tell us about <laughs> a time when you slipped on something. <laughs> um. Can it be part of a performance? Sure, yes, yes. Well, actually, it's part of a performance that was not intended. Um, oh. I was playing, it was my first professional production. I was playing Juliet uh, at a, a regional theater. It was, my, is, it was the thing that broke my career. Like, that's how everything started. And, and there was one moment on stage right after I um, marry Romeo and, <laughs> And I got my dress stuck on his shoe and completely fell on the stage in front of the whole like 900 person audience, <laughs> flat on my face right after a very romantic exchange of vows. And my acting partner, Jeffrey, was like, oh, my sweet Juliet, <laughs> like ad-libbed, <laughs> ad-libbed Shakespeare <laughs> to get me up off of my feet. <laughs> So did, any, did people think it was actually part of the performance? I am sure people knew that that was not <laughs> okay, part okay. of the performance. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. That's, yeah. that's awesome. And you said that is what began your career. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, so I, I did a, a musical theater program the summer between my second and third year of college in New York called Cap 21. And um, at one of our, they would they would frequently bring in um, casting directors and producers and people like that to do master classes with us. And we had a master class with a casting director from Bernie Telsey Casting, who's a really big New York casting office. And um, I decided in the bathroom that instead of doing two songs, we'd only been working on songs, we hadn't been working on monologues. Instead of doing two songs, I would do a monologue and a song. Um, I just decided in the bathroom. Okay. And then that's the best decision I ever made because my acting is much stronger than my singing and the casting director saw something in my monologue and started mm -hmm. calling me in for auditions. So during my uh, third year of college, I went in multiple times. I took the train from Charlottesville, Virginia into New York City to audition for these regional theater productions mm -hmm. that this casting director brought me in for. And the third one I went in for was Romeo and Juliet. And it was um, an absolutely extraordinary experience. I was working with Juilliard 
teachers and Juilliard graduates and a cast of incredible professional artists. And wow. we were reviewed in, in the New York Times and in Variety. And we wow. were actually, it was, we were supposed to go to Broadway. We had a, a, a theater, we were gonna go to Broadway. It, it, was, it was kind of that big of a hit. And then 9-11 happened and all these theaters went dark. So we did not get to go to Broadway. But it, it launched my career. Uh, because of those reviews and that production, I then was fielding calls from agents um, who just who, who were knocking on my door, which is kind of mm. never how it happens. Wow. That was a, like a profound <laughs> gift. And I almost didn't audition for it because it, was, it conflicted with the first five weeks of my final year of college. Mm. And I called the, the uh, and I told casting I wasn't gonna audition. And the um, casting director who'd really taken me under his wing called me directly and was like, if I have to drive to Virginia and put you in my car and bring you, I will do that. You have to audition for this. And I have him to thank for wow. everything he's launching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when 9-11 when happened, was there a moment where you thought, it's just all over? Did you think this, I mean, that must have been really, I mean, obviously for all of us, it was very shocking yeah. and, and tragic. But I mean, did you think at that point, wow, this is not gonna happen? Uh, that like, that what was not gonna happen? Because you didn't get to go to Broad, you didn't get to get yeah, in the city. I mean, I wasn't thinking about that at the yeah. moment. Like what I was mostly, what it, it was a, a pretty profound experience. You know, we, um, we had just had our, our, our first week or our first couple previews or something, and we were just coming back in from, from a day off. And so a bunch of the cast weren't able to make it. They were still stuck in New York and couldn't make it clear out in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, so we canceled that Tuesday performance. But when we came back on Wednesday, there was something in the energy because the show, Romeo and Juliet, is really about these two families and this like senseless hate between mm -hmm. these two families that doesn't make sense and, and creates agony everywhere right and so there was something about having just witnessed this like senseless hate that made the audience gasp and breathe in a different way and mourn in a different new way as right along with us while we were on stage it was a pretty epic moment of like connection from between audience and 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 performers hmm. but that's mainly the thing i was thinking about you know it was yeah, such a bummer when we didn't get to go to broadway but we were so caught up in the profundity of the fact that we were doing this play at this moment when this thing happened hmm. um, and that we were able to offer something to this audience in the midst of the grief hmm. wow amazing well, um, if you back up before that time, because that you said kind of that launched you, what were the events that happened before that that made you think, oh, this might be something that could be a career or something I'm really pa you're really passionate about that you wanted to pursue that you have talent at? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't remember a time when this isn't what I wanted to do with my life. Hmm. It was from my earliest memories are, are, you know, writing songs and performing them on coffee tables and forcing my parents to buy tickets to my shows in the living room. You know, <laughs> like it, it, it just was, it was so clear. And, and my parents, my parents would describe it as a moment when I was graduating from kindergarten, when we had a little performance and I just got up on stage and it was like I had always, was always meant to be there. Mm. Um, and then I was just, you know, my whole childhood, I was, I was doing community theater and school plays, any opportunity I had to, um, to dive in, I did. Hmm. Now, what was a point where, because you knew that was what you were passionate about, was there a point later where things, lined up and you thought, oh, this could legitimately be what I do for a living. You know what I mean? Like the first time you thought, ah, oh, this is real. I, th I mean, I think it was that, that production of Romeo and Juliet huh. and because I, you know, I, I was in the middle of a, um, a drama major at, at the University of Virginia and I, w I was, I was getting a lot of encouragement there, getting a lot of cast, you know, being cast a lot, all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but you, but there's no way, I mean, it's such a competitive industry that there's no way 
for me to know whether I could actually do this for a living. Um, so it was really leaping into this thing, getting cast in that role where I was like, oh, I could, I actually might have a chance to like live my dream, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, it, and it's interesting because I also, um, you know, it's, it's such a crazy business and it's so hard to keep your feet on the ground. And then there are moments when you feel like you're screaming into a black hole and nobody wants to hire you at all. And that happens even now. I mean, that happens after 20 years in the industry. Hmm. Um, it is such a fickle, it's such a fickle business, you know? Um, so I, I really keep trying to, to ground myself in the truth that I am exactly where I'm supposed to be in this moment at present right mm -hmm. now <laughs> yeah yeah that's great um well moving forward from uh that experience can you tell me about when you first moved out to los angeles and just what that transition was like yeah um well it's interesting because you know we i got i got married a month after graduating from college and then my husband peter and i were in new haven connecticut for the first two years of my acting career mm -hmm. i was commuting in and out of new york um on the train and we and he had applied to phd programs and got into the one at ucla and we were like in between we were homeless in this moment uh we had left our apartment in New Haven, we were gonna have graduate student housing in UCLA, but we had like a billion weddings to go to that summer <laughs> on the <laughs> East Coast. So we were literally living out of our car and couch hopping for three months when I got cast uh, for my first series regular gig, which shot in Utah. So we made the move across country and Peter deposited me halfway across in Utah in an apartment <laughs> and then continued on to California and then we, he commuted for like three years while I did that show. We bought a house in Utah and he flew, he flew out to LA every Tuesday and then back every Thursday. So that was my first taste of Hollywood, but it was like, it was like a, cause it was my first real TV stuff, hmm. but it was sort of a soft intro. Cause I wasn't in Hollywood. I was like very secluded and protected in this mountain town with these awesome actors. And we always had dinner together and stuff. And then when that show ended, fully moving to New York, that was a shift. It was mostly a shift for our marriage because we had never lived and worked in the same town. Hmm. And we'd wow. already been, we'd been together for five years at that point. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And you said that, you said the fully shifted after, after that show ended, what was the name of that show? It was called Everwood. Okay. And after that show ended, then you moved, that's when you moved to Los Angeles? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then that was just like, you know, we bought a house in LA at that point and, and I was just in the audition circus running around going from thing to thing to thing. I was guest starring all over the place mm -hmm. until I landed Grey's Anatomy. Mm, okay. Tell us about the day that you found out that you were given the offer and you, you realized that you were going to be a series regular on that show. What was that like? That was wild because <clears throat> I was brought on to the show just to do two episodes. And I was told from the beginning, I would only be do, do, doing two episodes. I didn't actually audition for that. Like Shonda Rhimes offered that to me because I had just done a pilot for her the season before that hadn't gotten picked up. And she's like, come over, play with us for two episodes. I knew from the get go, my character was getting fired after the second episode. And mm -hmm. so I treated it as like, I'm going to show up and do it as, as I do all my guest stars, you know, hmm. full heart, full commitment, but not attaching myself because I know I'm leaving. And after my second episode, I went off. I did like a couple episodes on um, Mad Men and I did some, I did a Glee. I did a Supernatural, like all, I did a whole bunch of one-offs. And then- Is that the when you were Kitty, when you played Kitty? Yeah. Okay, in Mad Men. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then on the morning after my firing episode aired, I got a call from my agent saying, so they want to bring you back and this might become a series regular. Hmm. And I was like, uh, okay. And then it was that entire rest of that season, I was basically auditioning for the entire season because I was not given wow. a pickup until the summer after that season, about a month before we started shooting season seven. 
And for those of you who don't know, what does it mean that you weren't given a pickup? So that means that basically um, I was on a track to maybe become a series regular. So like every three episodes, I'd get a little pay bump and then another little pay bump. But I would be like scouring every script to be like, how much do they write for me? Mm. Are they going to give me something to do so I can show them what I can do? Like every episode was how can I, how can I, you know, make myself invaluable to this community, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and then, and then the, we, you know, we wrapped season six in April and I was not told that I had a series regular job on the show until June. Mm -hmm. And then we started shooting the next season in July. So I had like three months while everybody's on hiatus, which is the break that you take when you're on a TV series um, between seasons to just go, well, I don't know. I hope I, I hope, I hope they like me. <laughs> There's a lot of sort of just hanging on and, and having, and having to surrender because you can't control anything in this business. Right. Oh, sure. Now, did you then also go back to Mad Men as well for more episodes? I, I feel like I had done some before my episodes on Grey's and then I went back and did a couple more. Right. And then that was it. It it was yeah. over before my the Grey's got picked up. Right. My okay. Okay. And uh, I'm a huge Mad Men fan. I'm sure others are watching too. Can you just talk a little bit about your experience working on that show? Oh my gosh. That was so amazing. I still don't understand why they didn't expand that relationship it was so fascinating um my last episode on the show was me realizing that my husband was gay and being like what am i doing here it was like <laughs> the know? camera was doing like a push in and your yeah. face you're saying everything with your face what yes in it's silence crazy. just like I, my whole life is not what I thought it was. Um, and then end of character. End of character. I know there was nothing else after that, which was so crazy. I was just like, this could be so rich and so juicy right, and so right. many things. And like, what does she do? Does she stay? Does she leave? Right, like, what's the conflict? Right. And like, does she make the best of it? Like what, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. But yeah. Did you did you work out any of that in your head or did you just kind of leave it and you're like, okay, this is You mean when playing it? Yeah. Did you did like, you did you think about what she was gonna might do in the future? Anything like that as part of Um you always do that. Whenever yeah. whenever you're on a whenever you're a guest spot, you're like, you could bring me back. I could be a recurrent because of this connection to this character. And I could always come. I mean, we actors are always trying to find ways in our imagination to do more than is offered to us. <laughs> so, I'm sure that was there. But at the same time, when you're there shooting on the day, you just remain totally present and and in that exact moment. It's it doesn't help to get ahead of yourself while you're actually shooting the scenes. Oh, sure, yeah. And that scene that we talked about when the camera is kind of pushing in on you and you're having the realization, to me that uh, really illustrated, I think how good you are at um, bringing the inner life of your character to life, you know, that as an audience member that we're able to really experience your conflict and turmoil and just what's going on inside of you. So. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like for you building up that inner life for your characters? You know, I think um, for me, it, it starts with empathy, right? So <clears throat> empathy for the person I'm playing. So I, I, I'm, I'm able to enter into the shoes of a villain by getting to the, the, th the reason why that I can justify so that I can unconditionally love the character and the, and the choices the character is making. Because mm. people don't do things in life unless they have a reason. Mm. You know, that, that, that has to be, you just don't do things. And, and the reason could be super twisted from my perspective, but I have to untwist it in my head in order to approach it without any judgment. So that's, that's really the place that I start. Um, and then I will go over, I, I, you know, I, I do a whole thing if I have like a big arc on an episode or a movie where I write out 
just wh where I am, because we shoot totally out of order. So I like to keep track of what happened just before, what's coming up next, and just like a quick like cheat sheet that I can always look at. But inside of that, it's like, where am I in relation to this character? And what has happened? And how do I feel about this person? And what am I trying to do in the scene, right? So then there's that, that that's my preparation where I, where I really kind of hash the scene out in my head, like this is the direction, this is what, how I, this is what I want to play. And then you show up on set and a, some of that stuff may totally go out the window because at that point, that, after you've done your preparation, once you're there on set looking at your acting partner, you just need to listen and respond. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's what needs to happen. You just need to be, um, reacting to the things that they're offering you and and then giving them something as well so it's it's many different facets but it always begins with unconditional love hmm. yeah that's amazing have you found that in your life that because you have that view toward characters that that helps you to even connect to people more that maybe oh. yeah <laughs> Like, yeah, I mean, that's honestly, like, if I wasn't an actor, I'd probably be a therapist. Huh. Just because I am fascinated by what motivates people and where they come from and trying to understand their perspective. Like, that is, that's what I love the most <laughs> about human interaction. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think it does, like, being in the practice of unconditionally loving every character that I have to play allows me to then offer unconditional love and empathy. Not always, I mean, I certainly fail at that many times. Um, but that, you know, it, it definitely helps in that regard, I think. Hmm. Well, you know, as you look back, are, I mean, you've played many different roles. Are there favorites that you have that uh, you really connected to? I will say uh, that Romeo and Juliet will, I, I don't know that anything will ever top that experience. I, and I think that has something to do with the moment in life that I was in. Um, my husband proposed to me after opening night of that show. Like I was, I was finishing college. I was a baby in so many ways. I just recently found my journal that I, that I kept during the show because my professors at UVA allowed me to do it as an independent study and get three credits for it. Just as long as I kept a journal. And I journaled every day of that experience and I learned so much. My artist brain was, ex was exploding and flying on all cylinders and shifting and changing and growing. And I just, I've never, never had an experience like that since. I've had a lot of great experiences, but not like that. Mm. Yeah, it's, I mean, you've worked on some really, um, uh, some just shows that have, a, a, an important place just in our pop culture, you know, that shows that a lot of people are watching, talking about. Can you uh, talk about um, a favorite memory when you're working on Glee? <laughs> oh man, I, I like that. That whole thing was so much fun because she was such a wackadoo character, and I and I loved. Um, I loved the like weirdness of her wardrobe and the mm. creepiness of her obsession and getting into the mind of someone who like fully committed to this crush in an epic way. And like, I, I, I just, I loved every piece of it. And the other thing that was kind of fun about it is that I did that show first season before it had even aired. So none of those kids were the Beatles yet. Like they were not, nobody was famous yet. It was a, a group of fun kids who were just so psyched to get to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And it was episode nine. I think I did episode nine of the show. And, and, so, and like they were so wide open and delighted and grateful and excited. And so the energy on set was just so wonderful. It was great. Hmm. And what about Everwood? Are there... Uh a favorite experience that you can think of from your time on Everwood? I, I, I had a lot of favorite experiences. I mean, I think the, the, most, the, the most special aspect about being on that show was how close I was able to get with the cast because it was this little transplanted group of actors living in the mountains together, you know? So we didn't have 
the craziness of the industry and and all of that stuff clouding anything for us. We were just there having fun and being together. And like, I learned how to ski while I was there. And um, oh my God, it was just so beautiful. I do remember like one scene in particular, I had to shoot a scene where I got food poisoning and we were shooting and it was like, 10 below. It was freezing cold, but I had to strip all of my clothes off because I was getting hives and getting overheated. So that was an interesting thing to try to wow. play in the freezing cold. <laughs> wow. Well, if you if you could go back and give advice to yourself at any point in your career, what time period would you go back to and what would you say to yourself? It's so funny because my therapist just asked me to write myself from from my my thirty something year old self um, to, <laughs> to to write my twenty year old self a letter and then from my twenty year old self write my current self a letter. Wow. So I've just done this this exercise and and what was interesting is I just did it after reading this like journal that I had kept when I was twenty and when all these things were happening. And, um, and there, were, there was like one very specific moment that jumped out at me in reading the journal. I, I, had, um, I, had, I had a group of 24 students from UVA take a road trip to come see me in Romeo and Juliet in Princeton. And they sat in the balcony and they did like the UVA chant from the balcony when we came out for curtain call. And, and when, when I came out to see them afterwards, after they had taken this epic drive to come see me and find places to stay and whatever they gave me this card and I describe it in my journals like the card is full of we love you we miss you not you're so amazing I can't believe how phenomenal you are mm -hmm. it was we love you we miss you we love you we, we miss you and I'm writing uh, my little 20 year old self is writing in this journal like this this is what I want to hang on to I want to hang on I don't want to get swept away by trying to impress people or by getting the next gig so that I can be successful. I want to stay focused on loving people and being loved. And that that needs to be the core always. And, and that needs to be the driving force anytime I do a project. How do I love these characters? How do I love the audience through this, the telling of this story? So my letter to my 20-year-old self would be like, keep that keep that fire alive like return to that truth and that ultimate vision and drive and even if even it, it has to become a practice but you must return to it otherwise this industry will eat you alive and you will never feel like you're enough mm -hmm. yeah that's great well um i just want to take a moment as we're halfway through our time together um i just like to thank everyone again for joining us. Reminder that you can uh, ask your questions in the Q&A part of the box below. Uh, at the very end, I'm gonna be giving away three books and based on trivia from things that Sarah is saying to us right now. Oh my gosh, so uh, we'll see who our winner is gonna be. Um, also, I'd like to go on, what'd you, you say? To go ahead, I was just wondering, am I gonna answer some of these? Um, after you ask a couple more questions or I've been kind of weaving them through oh, okay. <laughs> very slyly, but yeah, you can look them over as I'm, yeah. uh, yeah, okay. but yeah. And tonight's interview is sponsored by Navigators Hollywood, which is dedicated toward giving entertainment professionals the opportunity to explore faith, ask questions and share their point of view. If you're in entertainment, you'll want to check out the upcoming alpha course which is a series of sessions exploring life, faith, and meaning. Uh, each session looks at a different question that people often have about faith. And those times together are designed to create conversations. It's an open, informal, and honest space to explore and discuss life's big questions. I mean, what an amazing time <laughs> to be thinking about life's big questions. There are a lot of life big questions at the moment. Anyway, all backgrounds are represented. All questions are welcomed. So this alpha is for entertainment professionals, hosted by entertainment professionals. To find out more, go to the alpha tab at navigatorshollywood.com and I'll 
put that uh, URL in the chat box so for everyone to see. But um, yeah, so Sarah, can yeah. you would you describe yourself? I mean, I just talked about faith, asking big questions about life. Would you describe yourself as a person of faith? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think it's the it's the grounding. My faith is my grounding force in my life. I think. I think it would be a lot harder <laughs> if in this industry if I did not have my faith to hold on to, that's for sure. Mm. And what ha, how has that impacted like decisions that you've made? I mean, what does that look like, especially just working as an actress in this industry? Um, I mean, there there are there are a lot of first of all, it, it, it's it's given me a sense of of peace. Um, in, in the midst of the crazy ups and downs of, of what this industry is like, you know, I've turned down jobs, I've turned down roles, um, or I've turned down auditions because I'm like, mm, I'm not sure that there's anything that I want to put out into the world that I think is going to ultimately benefit an audience, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, in any way that's positive or that's heart expanding or makes people laugh or cry or, or think in a new way, right? So I think um, for me, choosing roles and um, choosing projects is, is mixed up with my value system that's grounded in my faith. Um, I think um, I, I, I no, knowing that, that that I can say no, and that I I know for sure that I am being held by something greater than myself, it allows me to not kind of go down the desperation train, which um, which is so easy to do. I mean, especially especially now with social media and with like we, we are not meant to have the kind of feedback that we get mm -hmm. in, in, in social media. We're not, we're meant to get feedback from a, a small community of humans that we're in relationship with. We are not meant to hear 400,000 people's opinions of what you look like or how angry they are at you or whether they hate you or love you. Like it's, it's an overload. So for me, grounding myself in my in my faith ultimately as a child of god and my identity as a child of god first and then and then a wife and mother and then a friend before i even kind of get to the actress piece hmm. allows me to receive that feedback but not let it hit um and i don't i will say it's a it's a daily struggle it's not it's not it's not like, oh, I have X, X amount of faith, so therefore I'm not going to be affected when someone screams at me on Twitter, you know, <laughs> or, or tells me I'm the most hideous thing they've ever seen, you know, or whatever. Um, it, it, I, you know, I'm human, obviously, but I do think that knowing that I have that sort of foundation and rock to keep returning to uh, when the waves are slapping me around and the wind is slapping me around, and knowing that my identity is beyond um, my success in this industry, it is, it's, it's the only way I could survive from my perspective. It's the wow. only way I could survive this industry. Mm -hmm. That's for mm -hmm. sure. Well, I find it interesting that you said that you show your characters unconditional love. And it's like, it sounds like you live in that unconditional love yourself. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like yeah. you, you in your life exist in that space that you then use to help your own characters come alive and connect with them. Yeah, I mean, for me, if I were to look at it like, you know, the way that I look at my children, I have this like undying, unconditional love for them. They don't have to perform in any way or be successful in any way mm. for me to love them, right? So because I ha we have so much feedback as actors and celebrities in this industry, you could very easily start to go, okay, you liked me, but you didn't. And then you liked me. And so like, 
am I actually lovable? I don't know because I'm getting mixed messages and it's overwhelming. But if, but because of this like parental, which I have, is how I would describe like the love of God to me, this unconditional kind of parental love. I, I can lock back into that and be like, doesn't matter what all of those people say. It doesn't matter if I get that job or not. I am loved, period. End of story. Just because I am and just because I was made, I was beautifully and wonderfully made. And, and, I, can, and I can understand that because I, I'm doing that with my kids. Like, I see that, you know? But the love that I feel is even bigger, you know? So it is a very... Um, comforting thing for sure yeah i just want to let that soak in because <laughs> it's something that i think we all need to remind ourselves of i mean yeah uh i mean as you've been living through your life and your career are there times where you thought oh that was god like something happened or something experienced and oh yeah i i mean i remember this one time i um early in my career i had been unemployed for like nine months i hadn't gotten a job and i and i finally got a job um, I got an offer to do a play that I had felt from the beginning. I'm like, this is, I shouldn't be doing this. I don't, I don't think this does that thing that I described before, which is like offer something positive to the audience. And, and I was sure about that. Honey, I'm in the middle of a live thing. That's my daughter. Snuck <laughs> 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 away. <laughs> Oh my God. Um, but I, I was, I was in the middle and I, and we were like cash poor and like, you know, my husband was in graduate school. I had not worked in nine months. We were, I had barely started my career. We did not have money. And I turned it down because I just, I knew I wasn't supposed to do it. And it was literally two days later, I booked my first guest spot on a television show, which was this hilarious show that only went for a couple episodes called Wonderfalls. It was my first guest spot playing a very weird character, but it was delightful and fun. And because I was working so much overtime on that episode, I made enough money to get SAG insurance. And that last check came in on December 31st. I was able to be insured for the entire next year. And that like cushion of money and the thing that I turned down was a play that would have made a fraction of it. So it was like oh. the provision that came from kind of going, I got to listen to my gut here mm -hmm. um, because I don't, I, I, I think, I don't think I should do this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I have a lot of little, a lot of stories like that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, I have felt God's presence beside me, in front of me, behind me, around me every step of the way. Yeah. That's amazing. That's great. Well, um, are, as you look back on your career, is there something that you think of that you think, yeah, that's, I would put that at the top of one of the most valuable things I've learned as an actor. Yeah. Okay. Um, it was actually my first movie. First time on set, um, I, I was playing Ed Harris's daughter in a movie called Radio. And I had this crying scene that I had to do. And I came from theater, had never done, never stepped foot on a film set. And what I do in my process is I show up to every rehearsal as if the audience is already sitting in the audience. You know, it's like, if we're going to rehearse it and figure out what this scene is, I'm going to give it my all. So I came to the rehearsal for this scene, fully giving it my all, right? There was another actor on set that um, came up to me and was like, honey, you know, you really need to learn how to like pull it back and like only give it when the camera's on you because otherwise you're going to use up all your emotion when the camera's not even on you and then you won't look as good. Hmm. And I was like, huh, okay. And then Ed Harris comes up to me and he goes, that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> he, goes, he goes, I do my best work off camera. And if you are not giving your acting partner 110%, you are not doing your job. This is what we do. We show up and that's what you're doing. And you have to continue to do that. And I was like, Ed Harris, I will listen to you. <laughs> um, and that's, and that's really, that's like one of the best pieces of advice. Um, and it was the, the beginning of my career. So, so I am, I always, I always show up for my acting partner 
Mm. The cameras on me or not doesn't matter. We're all in this together. It's not about me and getting the perfect shot. It's about telling a story well. And when I can help the other person shine even more by being generous with them, then the whole thing is better. And the storytelling is better as a whole. And that's, that's it. Yeah. Mm. Wow. That is a great lesson. I remember when I was studying film at New York University, Jonathan Demme came in and spoke and he said that uh, to what, the point you just made, that he would always mic his camera, his actors when they're off camera and uh, make sure that they brought their performance every time because in his experience, that then gave the other actor something to work with, brought up their performance, so. I, I mean, you, you can, t I mean, I've, I def <laughs> I've had moments where I'm like crying my eyes out and the person across from me is wearing their pajamas, like hasn't even bothered to put their wardrobe on, you know, mm. or is reading off of their sides because they can't be bothered to learn their sides when they show up. You know, I will never do that. That's not a thing I will ever do. I will not leave my partner out to dry I, I, because it affects my performance. So if it's like, I know what it is on the receiving end of it. So I also know what it feels like when your acting partner is extremely generous. Mm -hmm. You get to shine. You, I mean, you get to look better than you did before. So like, come on guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's so Raise mad. I get, I get, Raise I get, the bar. Man, yeah, Put I get up. fired up. I have, I've gotten to do a couple, um, get to lead a couple pilots in the last, in the last couple years. And the last one I did, I just set the tone by showing up without sides in my hand, without my script. And, and that was just like, so every, everybody did. And so we're all like, we know it. We're, we're showing up to work. We're yeah. here, ready to go, ready to give it our all, you know? Um, yeah, so. Makes a huge difference. It really does set the bar where it needs to be. I, I, I shot a film. it saves time. I mean, that's oh, the other thing. It saves, it saves time, which that's, that's like, you, the greatest gift you can give to your crew is to show up prepared so that they can get home to their families because they're working longer hours than you are every single day. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Well, some people that are watching today, they're not actors, but yet they have to perform because they, I mean, our, our society has shifted so much that so many people now are having meetings on Zoom or they're getting in front of a big group of people and they get stage fright, you know, they, uh, and so what would you say advice for those folks, like how to work through that? Like just from an actor's perspective. Stage fright. I mean, I, I you know, the, the funny thing is that after, uh, after I was, um, after I left Grey's Anatomy, I was back in the audition circuit and I found myself getting really anxious before auditions. All, because I hadn't auditioned, really done much auditioning at all in nine years because I was busy, you know? Um, for me, like, honestly, the best thing I've been doing is yoga. I, I know that's weird, but like, because the practice of it is, like locks you into deep breaths. Mm -hmm. And so when you can return to your breath and breathe in and slow it down and breathe out, and breathe in, even if you just like at the beginning of your Zoom meeting, right before you hit that thing, you just do like 10 really deep, calming breaths. You will not, you'll oxygenate your whole face so you'll look like you're glowing. That's mm -hmm. another thing. Um, but you'll, your heart will calm down. All the stuff that's like this will be like, I can do this now, I can do this. I think there's also, if you're, if you're talking about the Zoom stuff, put, like, don't look at anybody, you know? Mm -hmm. Just cover the screen and just talk to the green dot. Mm -hmm. So that you're not, because the other thing about the Zoom stuff is that you're, you're checking in with yourself. You're not only just watching everybody else and it's exhausting because you see all of their tiny little eye movements and you're like, mm -hmm. what are they, do they, are they checking their phone? Or if I lost our attention, like you're just obsessed with what they're doing. And then you check in with yourself and you're like, how am I performing? Do I look okay? How's my hair? Like there's just this constant evaluation, which eliminates your ability to be present in the moment. So if you can, if you can shut all that out and literally just talk to the green dot and 
fully do what you prepared to do to the green dot, I think it will really eliminate some of that stress and anxiety. That's great advice. And there, there are also apps you can get that help you with the deep breathing too. Yeah. I found really helpful. Um, now, as you look back on your career, was there a particular role that you thought was the most challenging? I can, um, hmm. I, I've had like challenging aspects to, oh, okay. I'll, well, I'll tell you about a, two really challenging moments on Grey's Anatomy because there was this one mo moment where we had to span an entire year in one episode and my character during that year had gone off to the front lines to be a medic in the middle of the war mm -hmm. and that after she had just lost her baby and then she returned home like a different person. I had no time to create this new character after having played this character, this person that I was familiar with for eight years and all of a sudden in the script, it's like, she's completely different. Okay. <laughs> I remember I talked to people about PTSD. I talked to, you know, experts who had been there and seen, I, I would put images in my head of like dead bodies and like, I would calm my emotions down so that I was just delivering words instead of feeling things, which is what my character used to be. But I remember showing up on that first day, shooting this new person. And I broke down in tears like three times just to be like, I don't know who I am. I am a completely different human and I don't know how to create this human for you in absolutely no time. Um, but it, it ended up working. I had a great director during that time and, um, and it was great. And then the other really challenging moment that I had was my character um, lost a baby and I was actually pregnant with my daughter Hannah while I was playing that storyline. And I had to shoot this scene when I was eight months pregnant where I have um, an induced termination because my baby is, has a terminal illness and is in pain in utero. And I make this horrifying decision to terminate when my character is pro-life and like uh -huh. all this stuff uh -huh. is like agonizing, right? And I'm doing this while I'm really pregnant with my daughter. Oof. And I had to play this scene where I deliver the baby, hold the baby, the baby squeezes my finger, we baptize the baby and then the baby dies. And it uh -huh. took 10 hours to shoot this whole sequence. And I went into premature labor the next day, six hours later. And uh -huh. my baby was born a month early and she was in the NICU for two weeks. So that was challenging. <laughs> oh my God. That was agonizing. Yes, I did not know that I was doing that to myself when I agreed to play the storyline. <laughs> uh, wow. And how did you work through that? Um, Xanax. <laughs> 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 I, know I had, I, I had postpartum and I had to get some medication for it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I, it was really challenging, um, oh. kind of going, I think, I think I, I'm feeling guilty that I had done this to my child. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of prayer. I wasn't really able to pray, but mm -hmm. I had a lot of people praying for me mm -hmm. in that moment. Um, one of my, one of my friends uh, was like, you know, we always think that it's our job to take care of the baby that's inside of us. But sometimes, I mean, if, if we kind of exist outside of time and that baby always has been in the same way you always have been in some way, then like maybe that baby was taking care of you and helping you through it too. You know, <laughs> that was something really profound to like feel connected to her. Um, I don't, any, any way that I could that I could get out of just the sheer anxiety of having made this choice that resulted in this situation. So you felt like your performance in that moment led to your baby being? Absolutely, there's no question. Really? There's no wow. question, yeah. Yeah, wow. it, my body was triggered because I was playing, mm -hmm. I was in, my character was in labor. Uh, so, and then I was traumatized. So my character was experiencing trauma and your body chemistry has, oh. doesn't know the difference. When you're in a scene and you're like fighting for your life or you're being traumatized or brutalized or you're screaming and running from a tiger or a killer or whatever, 
you are going in, you're, all of those chemicals are being released in your body when you are fully imaginatively there and then the acting partner and the whatever is coming at you. What All of the stuff in your body happens for real. Your body doesn't know that this is an, Im an imaginary thing. It just right. does what it's trained to do. Right. So my body went into this trauma reaction mm. and I went into labor. And did you, uh, did you recognize that immediately, like when that happened? Or was it later that you looked back and realized that? I, I, pre I mean, I pretty much realized it. Wow. I mean, I was in too much of just like, we didn't even have a room for the baby yet. Like right. it wasn't even, we weren't ready and there was no way. In fact, I went through a lot of labor just sitting at my desk doing taxes. And I like mm -hmm. kept getting up and like, wow. ah. And then I went in, they're like, you're having this baby right now. I'm like, that's not a, we can't. And it was really when she was taken away from me after five minutes and I didn't get to see her again for hours. And then she was transferred to the NICU and then I had to wait more hours to see her. That's when it kind of like hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, mm. oh, what I did at work made this happen. Uh. Wow. Yeah. And, and to be fair, like the writers gave me an out because I got pregnant after this storyline was planned. Mm. And I had actually pitched this storyline before I was pregnant because it had happened to friends of my parents. Mm. And so I was like, my, my character's husband was an atheist and my character was a Christian on the show. And I was like, this could be a really juicy storyline of like, how do they navigate this thing? And mm. like, what do they decide to do? And then how does it affect their relationship? And there were so many things. And so I was like, well, I'm invested in this storyline that I pitched. I'm sure I'll be fine. Right, I right. Know. I didn't know. Mm. So yeah, it was it was intense. But there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot that's, my, when my character went through a divorce, I, I mean, I remember my husband, um, after weeks of these, like, these, like, agonizing episodes of just, like, misery in marriage falling apart, I would come home and I'd be, like, in this, like, dark cloud of sadness about it. And he, at one, after a couple weeks of just witnessing me not being able to shed what was happening on screen, he, he had to, like, take my face in his hands. He's like, we are still married. We are okay. Your children love you. And everything is fine. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I was like, I know. He's like, can I just talk to my wife? I'd really rather not talk to April tonight. <laughs> uh, I know you've had uh, imaginary trauma all day, but if you could just release it so I could talk to you, that would be great. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing just hearing the deep process that you go through and how you have to be good about having boundaries and creating boundaries for that not to impact your real life. But that's... That's I mean, a it, challenge. That's a real uh, challenge. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, part, part of that comes out of being, I mean, you are very good at your craft. And so that's like, because you're so good at drawing up those emotions and getting to that deep place, it's like, it just, I can see how on the other side that creates other challenges, but yeah. And the weird thing is that when I'm in the scene playing those epic feelings, I love it. I mean, it's like a drug to me because that's, I'm a four on the Enneagram. Um, so my, I don't know if any of you all know what the Enneagram is, but our currency is emotion. We love mm -hmm. feeling very big things. And our downfall is that then we wrap ourselves up in the blanket of those emotions and forget to like, remember what's objective. And we just get caught up in the subjective emotional. Well, cause I feel it, it must be true. Mm -hmm. You know? So what I have to keep coming back to is the straight edge of objectivity and truth, which is what my husband was doing for me on that day. It's like, wow. let's come back to truth. This is truth. Remember, mm -hmm. I know you feel so many things right now, but that is not real. This is real, you know? Right. And that's like for, that's like an everyday challenge for all of us <laughs> because oh, yeah. all of our emotions want to tell us what is true or not true. And it's like, uh, but is there a, a deeper truth beneath that that actually should be informing what we're doing, saying, you know? Yeah. And, and it is, it is sometimes the, um, sometimes the, the subjective stuff is so much louder mm. than the objective big T truth. 
Mm. Um, so you really, you have to practice returning to it. It's not a thing that you just easily go, oh, and especially for someone who like a four who feels things, sometimes I, I find, especially like in my like spiritual relationship, my relationship with God, I'm like, well, if I'm not feeling something epic with God, that must mean that's not, that isn't the truth. But for me, the healthiest place I can be in is to return to that, even if I don't feel it mm. and to practice returning to it daily um, through prayer, through meditation, through yoga, through scripture, through friends, you know, having conversations, like all that stuff, just like, and I have to do, I have to, pra I, if I don't practice, I get lost. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we have a bunch of questions that we've not Yeah, I'm about. looking at these. But I, what I want to suggest is that we do a little bit of a lightning round where I just ask you some, quickie, you know, some quick questions and then you just as quickly as you can uh, answer them. <laughs> okay, does that sound good? Sure. Yeah, okay. I mean, can I, I want to, and there's one that I see here that I do want to answer though. Yeah. Okay, um, from Athena Bashkul, I think. You, you asked, what's your best advice for believers for pursuing careers in the performing arts? Hmm. Um, that, that for me, and I would give this advice to um, people of any faith or people who don't practice religion in any way. Um, you have to surround yourself with truth tellers. You have to have a community of people in your life that you trust, that know you, truly know you for who you are. Um, that you will continually go back to and listen to so that when all this stuff spins and goes crazy in your brain, you can remember, you can go back and hear the truth. Because this, I, I mean, for me, the greatest challenge is, is, is the identity issue. It is a, it, this, this career messes with your identity in a really, really big way. So mm -hmm. any, any way that you can stay grounded, and for me, that's been having truth tellers in my life. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Now, what about balancing being a parent and acting? What what advice do you have? Like, what does that look like? Um, it's different all the time. I mean, the funny thing is, like, they always say, you know, women can have it all, and they can, but you will always feel like you're slacking on something, right? So, the best thing you can do is cut yourself some slack and give yourself a break. Um, so just lay that out there at first, you know, don't try to be a hundred percent of everything to everyone all at once. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, you know, it's, I've had seasons where I've been very, very busy and then seasons where I've had to absolutely just been home and home and home and home and home. And I really want to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it really, and it's, and it's really about taking advantage of the times that you do have at home, but also giving yourself the peace and the, and the, and the breaks that you need to really feed yourself again and to not feel guilty about self-care because you have to have self-care along with work, along with, um, raising your kids. You, you have to do, you have to do all of those things or you'll burn out. Any advice that you would give to young actors who've been in the business for a while? Young actors who've been in, like, child actors? I don't know, but when you do read out the question, it makes you wonder, hmm, young actors been in the business for a while. Been in the business for a while and you're still young. Right, you that's... Child that's actors. Might be mysterious. Um, you know, I wasn't a child actor, and I feel like... That was, that was a great gift to me because I was able to explore my joy and delight in it in, in an environment where I wasn't holding a crew up or, um, or trying to get the next gig or having financial pressure put on me to earn money to do it. You know, there was like a real freedom in getting to be a child but not in the industry. In the industry, it's a very adult place to be. Like, it's not a place for kids, I don't think. I, that's just me. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, I, I would give the same advice, which is you, you, gotta, you, ha you have to have people who tell you the truth that you will keep going back to and that you will trust. Um, that's the best advice I can give you. Okay. Well, we are, our time is coming to a close. 
Uh, we're going to, and I'll, as I'm talking, if there's anything, any final thing, if you want to glance over those, and if there's anything that you feel like you want to say, a final thing. Hi, I see Peter and Amanda Troutman. Hi. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, I know, but I just saw you there, and I just want to say hi. Um, <laughs> let me see. So, uh, but you can look at those, and okay. meanwhile, I'm going to give away, we're going to do some Sarah trivia now. Okay. So we're going to give away um, this book, You're Pulling My Leg, it's a game, lots of fun. So I'm going to ask a question, and the first person that answers the question correctly on the chat window will get, will win this prize, okay? So my <laughs> question is, uh, wait, I, first I need to pull up the chat window. Okay, there it is. Okay, great. So <clears throat> trivia question number one, how many episodes was Sarah originally promised when she was on Grey's Anatomy? Whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did it just explode? <laughs> okay, really good. Grant, you won that one. Fantastic. Uh, our next question is, I was impressed with how quickly people answered that question. So our next question is, <clears throat> uh, Sarah shows empathy to her characters by showing them what? <laughs> <laughs> it's there. Yes, look at that. Unconditional love. So do we accept love or should we just accept unconditional love? I feel like you should. You could accept love. Okay. Simona, we'll accept love. Simona was so the first Simona. person to bring the question on here. So. Congratulations. Yeah. And our final trivia question is, Sarah said, it's important to surround yourself with fill in the blank tellers. Oh, wow. Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Athena, you won that one. Nice job. People are paying attention. Fantastic. So those of you who won, if you can send me a uh, your send me your email through the chat you, you can send it i'm pretty sure you can just send it to me directly by to the panelist send me your email and then i'll email you back and get your address and then uh mail you out those books is there anything from what you just read through the questions there is any final thought to any final wisdom yeah. I have, well, I have this one question also from Simona. Um, she was saying that she face, you know, an aspiring actress worries about not landing roles. How do you maintain good spirits when it might seem like the industry is against you? Girl, I will say this is the challenge of my life. It is a daily struggle for me. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think for, ultimately redefining what it means to be successful, right? Mm. Um, what is success? Is success winning an Emmy? No. Is success being a star of a television show? No, actually success is being seen, known and loved and getting to offer that to other humans. So I, I think once again, it's a practice. It is a, pr a daily practice to return back to the truth of your belovedness. And I think one really, really good way to do that <clears throat> when you're feeling discouraged is aggressive gratitude. Keep a, a, a gratitude journal. And like, even if you don't feel happy or thankful about anything, just start writing down things you're thankful for. Just start writing them down and make a practice of it. And you will start to see there are so many blessings in your life. There are so many ways that you are beloved and valuable and worthy as you start writing those things down. Whatever the industry gives you or doesn't, it doesn't matter. It rolls off. It's not important. It's not important because it's not, it's a part of who you are, but it's not actually the depth of who you are. So there you go. Brilliant. Love it. Thank you. And again, uh, tonight was sponsored by Navigators Hollywood. Feel free to, free to go to the website, navigatorshollywood.com. Check it out. Check out uh, and sign up for the upcoming Alpha course, which is on there as well. I just want to say a huge thank you to Sarah. Thank you so much for 
sharing about your career, about your life, being vulnerable with some of the things that you've been going through in your life and even sharing about your spiritual journey as well. Uh, I know, Absolutely. yeah, I was blessed by tonight and what you shared with us and I'm sure so many people were as well, so. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's great to chat with you guys. Okay, good night, everyone. Good night.